the first thing you got to do is decrease all the resistance. You got to get that wall back down. And this is why this frontier of client experience is such a powerful thing is that it actually acknowledges that there's a human being on the other side of this buying decision. And that human being has literal feelings and motivations that if we create the right experience as we improve the experience, it all feels better. And that translates, we like to say soft skills yield hard dollars. This is an example of that. These feelings are the ones that improve all the ratios, all the conversion ratios across your entire sales process. Welcome to the Simple Brand Podcast, the show dedicated to helping you create simple experiences for your customers and for your team members. Each week, we're bringing you amazing interviews with business leaders and authors who will teach you how to differentiate your business with the one thing your customers need the most, simplicity. Your customers live in a complex world. Let's make it simple. Now here's your host, Matt Lyles. I started to notice a problem from a number of businesses. And I think the post-pandemic environment has actually helped to accelerate this problem even further. When it comes to revenue, most businesses don't appear to have a true revenue growth strategy, nor do they have the processes in place to even drive growth. Outside of that, some companies are really good at focusing on driving revenue through new customers while others are really good at only cross-selling to existing customers. And unfortunately, very few appear to be good at doing both. But it is possible to focus on and be good at both. And if you can drive simply reasonable growth in net new business while cross-selling your current clients, then you're actually able to double your revenue in less than three years. But it does take an intentional strategy, and it does take the right alignment between your sales and marketing teams. And this week's guest is here to help you learn how to do just that. It's Daryl Amy. Daryl's the author of the best-selling book, Revenue Growth Engine, How to Align Sales and Marketing to Accelerate Growth. He's the host of the Revenue Growth Podcast on the C-Suite Radio Network and the co-host of the Selling from the Heart Podcast. And he's a member of the Forbes Business Council and a C-suite advisor. Daryl and I discuss his lessons around aligning your sales and marketing teams, growing your revenue aggressively yet realistically, and the number one way to differentiate yourself among your competitors. Spoiler alert, it's all in the customer experience you deliver. So here it is. Here's my interview with Daryl Amy. Hey, Daryl, welcome to the show. Matt, it's great to be here today. Yeah, good to see you. All right, so we've got a lot to talk about, but before we get into your lessons, I want to know, can you tell me more about yourself and tell me more about Revenue Growth Engine? Yeah, thank you, Matt. I'm passionate about helping great companies grow, and there's so many reasons. I mean, great companies grow, they create great jobs, meaningful work, they get back to their communities. Let's just face it, when you walk in a business and things are, and I've walked in hundreds of businesses, you walk in a business and things are growing, it's upbeat, it's positive, you can just feel it in the air. And when things aren't growing, you kind of feel the opposite. And I love helping businesses grow because this is the fuel for everything. It's the fuel for great jobs, careers, the economy, nonprofits, all of it just gets me so fired up. Yeah, absolutely. And I think when we are able to cheer on other businesses, when we're able to help other businesses grow and grow the right way, yeah. then I think we're going to talk about this later too. They end up understanding how to serve other people, whether it's serving your customers, serving your community, especially serving your employees, all that kind of feeds off of those people mm -hmm. and, and it becomes contagious. It does. Then other people want to learn how to serve others well too. And like you said, to me, that's one of the best ways to grow the economy is to make sure that we're helping other businesses grow, grow the right way. Yeah, business is all about momentum. Jim Collins talks about the flywheel or any engine has momentum and revenue growth is the momentum inside a business. So this topic today is, is something I'm so passionate about, Matt. Yeah, me too. Because I mean, yes, we're all in the business of 
serving others, really. But also, we still have to make money. That's right. We still have to have that money in order to continue to serve others. And when we talk about revenue growth, you've got a law that you talk about, the law of exponential revenue growth. Can you explain that to me? You know, when we think about revenue growth, especially when it comes time to set goals, here's what I've noticed. Yeah. One of two things happens in most organizations. The first one is all too common. And that's what I call the spaghetti on the wall method, where they go, okay, we got to set a goal. We're going to throw some spaghetti on the wall. You know, the visionary owner is throwing stuff at the top of the wall near the ceiling, the more yeah. conservative people at the bottom. And they come up with a goal and then halfway through the year, they're not hitting the goal and everybody goes, well, it wasn't a realistic goal. Right. <laughs> Anyways, second way people set goals is what I call the ruler method, right? We're just going to put a ruler on the last couple of years bar chart uh -oh. and go, that's our goal. The problem with that is I think you're leaving money on the table. And quite frankly, the last two years have been for most businesses, either really bad or exceptionally good. And so there's not a whole lot of help there. So I look at ex exponential revenue growth and I say, hey, there's only two ways to drive revenue. You get net new business or you cross sell more to your current customers. And so most businesses, Matt, have discovered are good at one or the other. They're good at going out and yeah. getting new business, ringing the bell, getting the logos, all of that. Or they're good at really managing and growing their client relationships. Here's what I've discovered. When you get both net new and cross sell going at the same time, growth turns from linear to exponential. And now we can set goals around net new business. How many customers do we have? How many can we add? We can set goals around cross sell. What's our revenue per customer? Right. And how can we grow that? And now you're, you're coming up with a realistic goal based on those two drivers. And you're going to discover that it's aggressive because it's probably going to be a little bit bigger than the ruler. It's going to start looking a little bit more like a hockey stick. Oh, wow. When it comes to net new customers or cross-selling to existing customers, do you see those as equally valuable? It's interesting. I would say probably three to one. You know, if you look at a company and you say, are you better? Do you tend to be better at net new mm -hmm. or cross-sell? Probably two or three to one in my experience across multiple industries, businesses are good at net new and they're leaving massive amounts of low hanging fruit on the tree when it comes to growing their client relationships. Wow. It's a big opportunity. Mark Hunter, one of my favorite sales gurus, loves to say, you don't close a deal, you open a relationship. So that first order that comes in, it's not the end of marketing. It's not the end of selling. It's actually the ultimate permission to continue marketing and to continue selling. But Jay Abraham, another huge, yeah. massive Jay Abraham fan. Nice. Um, he says in his book, How to Get Everything You Can Out of All You Got, that you have an obligation, maybe even a moral obligation to make sure that your clients receive the best and highest value they can receive from your organization, which means when that first order comes in, it doesn't matter what you sell, products, services, it doesn't matter. When you get that first order closed, now the next order of business is to say, what can we do to maximize the value that this client is getting from us what can we do to give them the best and highest return on their investment from us? And in most cases, that's going to require them taking advantage of everything that you have to offer. I think so. And I think that speaks to something else that I like to focus on is also the customer experience. Mm -hmm. So not focusing so much on that transaction, that closing the deal, making sure that you complete that transaction. It's providing them with a great experience, even after they've signed the agreement. Like you just said, it's not the end of the deal. It's the start of a new relationship. Yeah. One of my favorite, I'm just throwing a lot of books here today. So we're having a good yeah. time. This is great. The Experience Economy, Joseph Pine and yep. James Gilmore. That's right. You know, and the Experience Economy, they said, look, products commoditized. That yeah. happened a long time ago. If you think you've got a product advantage, I hate to break it to you. Someone's going to clone that. I hope you have a product advantage. I hope you keep developing those, but you can't hang your hat there. Yeah. So then companies go service. We're a services organization. That's how we differentiate. And yet, Matt, I've never had, everyone's in the services business now. I've never had anyone say, 
our products are incredible, but our service kind of mediocre. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's saying, yeah, right. we got great products. We got great service. And buyers are going, what's the difference? What's the difference? And Joseph Pine and James Gilmore, in the beginning of the experience economy, they said some very simple words, welcome to the experience economy. What differentiates your brand from every other brand out there is the experience that you provide. And uh, this is incredibly powerful. I love the work you're doing on this with Simple Brand. Oh, thanks. Because the more we create an outstanding experience, yep. the more our clients want from us. It's actually really, really simple. Because sure. the reality is most client experiences, most customer experiences are really mediocre at best. But the excellent customer experiences are the ones that keep people coming back going, I want more of that. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the way to keep and retain loyal customers. And then if you do it really well enough, I think that also helps you in gaining the net new customers through referrals because your current customers are telling other people, hey, you know what? Here's the experience that I'm receiving over here. So I think you'll get a great experience too. Absolutely. And on top of that too, Think about the experience you provide your buyers during their initial buying process with you, right? Yeah. What's that experience like? <laughs> buying things are really, really complicated. The reality is now, especially in complex buying decisions, and I, I spend a lot of time in B2B sales where there's multiple decision makers, and quite frankly, getting all of them on the same page, collaborating and in agreement is really tough. In fact, in most B2B transactions, your biggest competitor is not who you think. It's actually the status quo. It's no decision, right? Because right. how do we get all these buyers on the same page? But the cool thing is when you start to really think about the buyer experience in the net new phase of your business, you can actually craft an experience that adds meaning, builds confidence, does all the things you were trying to do with your 80 slide PowerPoint deck on how great your company is <laughs> with, without having to, yeah. uh, to subject your potential buyers to that slide deck. And that's where client experience, customer experience, I'll explain why I differentiate between those two in a moment, but why the experience is so critical. This is where you set your company apart. And there are companies that provide great customer experience, and then there's my bank this morning. And I will yeah. say, on the way out of the bank this morning, I made the decision to switch banks. Oh, wow. Now, I didn't tell them that, but I found myself driving away going, this experience is so meaningless. And the experience of trying to set up a second account at this bank, I thought, I'm just going to go set up new accounts at a whole new bank. It'll probably be easier than trying to yeah. get this done as current customer. And I look at that and go, this didn't have to be that complicated. And yet, you know, now that relationship, which has been in place for over 10 years, is going wow. to somebody else. Wow. And so now, did you make any sort of complaint to the bank about this? Nope. Just kept quiet. Okay. <laughs> no. I mean, what's the point, right? Yeah. I think during the buying process, we signal what type of customer experience somebody is going to have. And um, Joey Coleman and Never Lose a Customer Again, another one of my favorite books, Hats Off to Joey Coleman, yeah, he's great. makes a very big point from real world research that people decide in the first 100 days of being a customer if they're ever going to buy anything from you again. I think a customer, by the way, is someone that buys a commodity. They go to Walmart and buy toothpaste. A client is somebody that goes to someone for experience. So in that toothpaste analogy, you might go to your dentist uh, to get some advice on what you should do about your <laughs> dental problem there. Just brought a really happy subject <laughs> into the podcast. But you see where I'm going, right? Yeah. Here's my theory. And uh, this is Daryl's theory. This is not backed up with scientific research. But my theory is when someone buys one thing from you, they're a customer. The moment they buy the second thing from you, they've become a client and you've started to earn the right to become a trusted advisor to them. So anyone can sell something with decent sales skills, can sell one time to somebody. The real key is what can you do to ensure that they come back for more? And the ultimate compliment is when they're asking you for advice and they're asking you how else you can help them because their experience with you has become gone from product to service to actually a great experience and they see you 
at, in your company as a trusted advisor. And at that point, you're golden. And I think that's the gold standard everyone should aim for. And all of that happens when we focus on creating an amazing, meaningful, consistent, insert adjective here, sure. customer experience. I'll use simple as an adjective to insert. <laughs> that's a, yeah. exactly. Yeah. It does need to be simple. And yeah, all of this, it needs to be consistent. It needs yeah. to add value. All of these things are so important. And here's the deal. In Revenue Growth Engine, we talk about how to align sales and marketing to accelerate growth. And the reason what was on my mind and on my heart as I was putting this book together was the frustration of misalignment. I started in sales 29 years ago, hardcore. I sold, I would date myself, office equipment, copiers, fax machines, and dictation equipment. Hardcore, wow. door-to-door, very, very competitive sales. I love sales. I love sales. I'm very passionate about it. I've been in sales development with a sales training company since 2004. I co-host the Selling from the Heart podcast. We have a blast. I love sales. Then in 2004, one of my first sales training clients, he said, everything you taught us was great, Daryl, but it doesn't say anything about that on our website. Do you build websites? So I dusted off my marketing degree. And as any entrepreneur would say, yes, sir, I build websites. Of course you do. Yeah. And I uh, started down that journey. I'd built one for a nonprofit, but I started down that journey of one foot in the sales world, one foot in the marketing world. And I noticed that there's a big problem. Yeah. Sales has a language. Marketing has a language. Sales has a viewpoint. Marketing has a viewpoint. And it's always, it doesn't have to be a massive Fortune 500 company for there to be silos. There's silos in small companies. And it's almost like there's just different directions, different languages. The reality is it slows everything down. If you've ever driven a oh. car that's out of alignment, you know what I'm talking about, right? Abs absolutely. You're going yeah. down the road. But here's what I saw the alignment point. And this goes right back to what we're talking about here. Yeah. If my car is out of alignment, I'm going to bring it into the shop. They're going to lift it up in the air. Um, they're going to put some stuff on the wheels. And there is a little dot on the back wall of the shop. And they point everything at that dot. And that pulls everything into alignment. What's the dot? It's your customer experience. It's looking at your customer. It's looking at who's my ideal client. What experience are we providing? So now yeah. we're not talking about sales. We're not talking about marketing. We're talking about everything through the lens of the customer experience. That's the dot on the wall. And now sales, marketing, and our friends in operations or customer success can all focus on that. And that's when things start happening. That's when things get simple. Oh, absolutely. And your experience is from the sales side. My experience is from the marketing side. I spent mm -hmm. 16 years in a marketing and brand career. So I completely understand that lack of alignment. And it's been around for decades and decades. As long as you've had sales and marketing together, there's been that lack of alignment. So you look at focusing on the customer experience, viewing it mm -hmm. from the customer's perception to bring them to, or to bring sales and marketing into alignment. Then what? How do you have sales and marketing continue to make sure that they're collaborating together in a reciprocal fashion? It's a great question. So when you start to map out that customer experience, of course, if you're using marketing language, we'll talk about customer yeah. journey or salespeople talk about buying process. Just look together at customer experience. Look through their lens. It's so funny, Matt. I'm preparing for a presentation and workshop for an EO group in Chicago next week. Oh, nice. And I, I in doing that, I was looking at my first company that I went to work for. And they had a really creepy graphic that must have been created in the 1970s of this human head with like a laser beams coming out of the eyes. And it was really creepy. But underneath it said customer vision. And that got drilled into our heads at my first employer. And, you know, as creepy as that graphic was, and I actually found it on the internet to insert in the presentation because I think it's so funny. The point is, when we take a client experience perspective, we look at everything through the eyes of the customer. Yeah. And so now looking at things through the eyes of the customer, these stages of the experiences are going through you know, awareness, getting on the radar through their initial conversations with you, assessment, what, whatever the stages are all, through, all the way through onboarding and renewal. We talk about these in the Revenue Growth Engine book. And uh, as they go through those, now sales can look and go, okay, well, what could we do? 
to make that process better, remove the friction, increase the motivation. Marketing, you know, instead of creating what, what I love, Jennifer Zick talks about random acts of marketing. I love that, right? Hats off. That's, you know, instead of creating random acts of marketing or viewing marketing as just dropping stuff in the top of the funnel, look at each stage and go, okay, from a marketing perspective, what could we do to make that client experience better all the way through? And to me, this client experience becomes the rallying point where everyone can get in the same room and look at it and go, okay, what could your team do to make this better? What could sales, what could marketing, what could customer success do to make this better? Then you just end up coming up with great ideas and you put them into a process and that becomes the way we do things around here. It's so funny. The businesses that I, I own and a lot of the businesses I work with use an operating system to run their business, just like... Right. Your computer has Mac OS if you're a good person and or if you have to suffer through Microsoft Windows. Either way, you've got an operating system. Sorry, I just uh, offended at least half of your audience. Maybe. It was fun, though. <laughs> so, yeah, you have an operating system for your computer. A lot of the businesses I work with have operating systems for their business. The one we work on is called Traction, the entrepreneur's operating system. And we run our businesses on that. And what's cool about that is that there are processes or for my fellow yeah. Canadian friends, processes <laughs> for HR, for shipping and receiving, for billing, for all manufacturers, all kind of processes in place. However, when you get to sales and marketing, it's like the Wild West. Right. Sales are like the folks hanging outside the saloon, flipping a coin, tumbleweeds are blowing by, and the sales manager swings through the doors and goes, Hey guys, y'all need to go sell something, right? You know, and and that's you know, it's like do your right. own thing, right? Yeah. We hire just go get your sales leaders. Go, we hire great people so they know what to do. Mm. Maybe, but why is your sales turnover for new reps over a hundred percent? Right, because there's no process in place. Marketing, you know, we don't get off the hook either. A marketing, oh yeah, is a lot of times. Hey, let's run an event. Let's run a campaign. Let's do a new social media channel. It's, you know, all these different things are all great. They're fantastic tactics. It's an incredible time in marketing right now. But how are those marketing tactics aligned with the customer experience? And so now, when we can take customer experience and look at marketing and sales and go, okay, what's the process here? And now we can apply marketing tactics and we can apply sales tactics to those stages of the client experience and actually create something that's predictable and simple. And when you bring someone in, you go, hey, this is how we do it around here. That's right. Not only this is how we do it, but this is how we view things. We view things from the perspective of the customer. Absolutely. Not from their perspective, their meaning marketing or their meaning sales, and not from my perspective and not from your perspective, but from the perspective of the customer. And I think that also helps when it comes to any sort of uh, apprehension around aligning yourselves with the other team, so to speak, because <laughs> right, <laughs> I can see, you know, wh whether it's sales or whether it's marketing, when I'm saying, well, you know, we know how to do things the right way because we're sales and we don't want to have to do things the way that marketing says and marketing will say, well, we don't have to do things the way that sales says. Well, no, neither of you are doing that. You're doing it for something else, something much larger than both of you. It's for the customer. Yeah, and the ultimate goal and the scorecard for this is revenue, right? And this yeah. is, I love the trend that's going on in a lot of a larger corporations right now, the rise of the chief revenue officer. Yes. So there is somebody that is answering for the revenue, top line revenue coming into the company. And so that to me is signaling more and more organizations are realizing we don't need these silos of sales and marketing. And now the even better terms that's coming out is revenue operations as well. So right. just to go, this, you know, this is something that is part of our DNA. It's woven through every single touch point with a client before, during, and after the initial sale. So to me, the mindset, it's a very 1990s mindset to have a sales team and a marketing team. This is a yeah. revenue team. We're working together to drive revenue. And the reality is, if you're not doing that, I think you're missing out. And the way people buy now is driving that. There's you know, incredible information available online. Brent Adamson in his uh, fantastic article in the last Harvard Business Review said, 
you know, the real job is sales right now. And I think I could also say marketing is what he calls sense making. Just help me make oh. sense of all of the stuff that's out there, right? That's it. And uh, this goes to the customer experience. Like, can we get in their mind and go, what are they thinking right now? You know, during this buying process, for example, what are they thinking? And how can we proactively set this experience up so we answer their questions proactively and we become that resource with a point of view that's helpful, not just for my sales friends, <laughs> an in-person brochure, right? Oh, goodness, no. <laughs> yeah. Did you know that in addition to my podcast and my articles, I speak to audiences all over to help them simplify their customer experience and simplify their employee experience. I've spent the last few years leading a crusade of simplicity across the globe. If you want a winning brand, you have to provide a simple experience to your customers and to your team members. Whether it's a live event or a virtual event, I'd love to partner with you and teach your audience how to do just that. With over a decade in marketing, I know how to hook and captivate an audience. And as a speaker, I know how to connect with the audience. Along with my lessons, I use stories and humor to keep everyone engaged and inspired. Then they leave with the knowledge and next steps to transform their business. As an event planner, you're managing lots of details to give your audience the most memorable event. The last thing you need is a speaker who will make your event memorable for all the wrong reasons. Not only will I leave your audience energized and inspired, I'll make it easy for your team to work with me. Hey, if I've built my brand around simplicity, then you know I'm going to make it simple for you. When you visit mattliles.com slash speaking, you'll find everything you need to know, including details on my topics, promotional materials, and most importantly, a link to connect with my team so we can book your event. So visit mattliles.com slash speaking. I can't wait to help your audience brand out from the crowd. And I think it goes to, on one side, what are they thinking? On the other side, what are they feeling? Ah, uh, yes. Because they may be feeling a lot of anxiety. They may not even know what questions they should have right now. They're trying to make sense of the world. And when you're able to understand both what they're thinking, what they're feeling, it helps you to be able to help them better understand how to make sense. It helps you to help them better understand what questions they should be asking that you can also then answer for them. Which is another reason why I really like the term experience because yeah. you know, all of the great sales trainers that I've had over the years, guys like Tom Hopkins and Zig Ziglar uh, yeah. would say, <laughs> we got to talk with Tom on the Selling from the Heart podcast uh, recently. Oh, wow. just, what a cool. treat. I mean, just what a treat. But what he's he's been saying over all the years he's been training and is buying is an emotional decision. Yeah, it, it just is. Right. Because at the end of the day, it's yeah, there's a rational component to it. But usually the rational component is to help overcome the fear of making a bad decision, for example. So there's a lot of fear and the fear is got to be acknowledged and understood. And it's not just fear, especially for our friends that are selling B2B. It's not just fear of making a bad decision. It's like you take that to its ultimate conclusion. If I'm responsible for making a bad decision, what's that going to do to my career? Yeah. I might miss the promotion. I might lose my job over this. So when you walk in with that level of understanding, that level of empathy yep. for what somebody is feeling, then the word experience is very, very relevant because we want to create an experience that alleviates fear. It builds confidence. And it's not just the content. It's not primarily the content. You know, we've all seen the research, like within 10 minutes of a conversation, people only remember oh. like 7% of the details. But they always remember 100% of their experience, how you made them feel. And that's what they take with them. And so, yes, of course, you need good content. You need good sales tools, you need good content. But you need to think proactively through every touch point with that client. And does that make them feel confidence or does that fuel fear? I remember Tom Hopkins teaching us years yeah. ago, 
this great model where you need to decrease fire resistance and improve and increase fire acceptance. And he said, the first thing you got to do is decrease all the resistance. You got to get that wall back down. And this is why this frontier of client experience is such a powerful thing, is that it actually acknowledges that there's a human being on the other side of right. this buying decision. And that human being has literal feelings and motivations that if we create the right experience as we improve the experience, it all feels better, literally. Yeah. And that translates, we like to say soft skills yield hard dollars. This is an example of that, right? These feelings are the ones that improve all the ratios, all the conversion ratios across your entire sales process. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I talk about this quite a bit, whether you're thinking it's B2B or B2C, or you're thinking of customer or client, you're dealing with people. Yeah. Real people. Yeah. Just like you, real people that have lots of external challenges, lots of internal struggles. And the more that you can better understand them as a person, the more you're able to provide them that experience. You know, an interesting add-on to that is when you think about the people that you're serving, I've had a great opportunity to speak with John DeJulius on the Revenue oh, Growth Podcast. He's the nice. relationship economy, customer yeah. service guru of gurus. And he made a really good point. He said, you know, a lot of times this is in customer service, but I think it applies across the board. We have, let's say your target ideal client is a C-level executive in a company. Okay. This person's probably on the senior side of their career. They're making a lot of money. They're very successful. They eat at certain places, not McDonald's right. and Taco Bell. They stay at certain places, not Motel 6, yeah. uh, it's Four Seasons, you know, and they have a lifestyle like that. And so we take younger employees a lot of times and bring them in to market to, sell to, and serve these clients that in other environments, when they get on an airplane, they're sitting at the front of the plane. And when they're connecting on their flights, they're not sitting in their seats with everybody. They're in a lounge. We serve those people, but we've got people on our team that don't quite understand the level of expectation. Yeah. And I think one of the things that I gleaned from our conversation and, and reading John DeJulius's books, which are fantastic, is yeah. it's really, really important to help our frontline employees and I believe our marketing and sales teams understand the life, the lifestyle, and the mindset of the people that they're selling to, whether it's a C-level executive or if they're selling into department managers or wh whatever that is, understand that because the level of customer service, the level of experience that person is going to have might be a Four Seasons experience where the person serving them may have never been to a Four Seasons before. Their best experience may have been nothing against the Hampton Inn, but hey, we've got to understand and really dig into the experience level of the buyer persona. Like, what did they expect? Yeah. What do they want? And I will say, when I started my career at 21 years old, and I'm now 30 years past that, uh, <laughs> so I've had, and I've had the opportunity to start and run some businesses. So my level of expectation is very, very different now than it was when I was 21 years old and just graduated from living in a college dorm room, right? So Of course, yeah. And that's where I think part of this buyer persona thing, mm -hmm. this may be a, actually a new thread of conversation here, but understanding like what's the experience that they are accustomed to? What do they expect? Wow. And a most obvious one is that C-level person that's of course. You know, flying first class. I remember back in the day, man, it was so fun. Salespeople would come back to the office dejected, depressed. Uh -oh. like, I can't close this deal. And I'm like, well, tell me about it. And they said, well, we're, we're going to save them $59 a month. And, you know, <laughs> you go, okay, well, 22 year old sales rep yeah. that's living in an apartment and trying to make their bills, but getting started out $59 a month is nothing to the C level executive. They spent more than that on lunch and right. the time they spent talking to you wasted $2,000 of their time. Exactly. And so this is just getting an idea of the mindset of who you're talking to and what level experience they're accustomed to. 
Yeah. And not just educating them, not just telling them about the experience, but having them experience it for themselves. This is what it's like to receive this type of experience. Absolutely. And after you've received it a couple of times, understand that the people that you're selling to, this is what they expect. Yeah. They have moved beyond that point to where they're thinking, wow, hey, this is pretty nice, to where it's essentially an expectation. Well, it's just, I was just getting all kinds of ideas sparked here because yeah. if I reflect back, my first five diamond experience was when I won President's Club for the first time. And I went out to that trip. It was at Torrey Pines and we stayed at, I think the Four Seasons or Ritz-Carl, I can't re yeah. remember, but I had never experienced anything like that before in my life. And so all of a sudden, I'm ruined. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, like, of course. Right. Yeah. It's what it, I'm not ruined, but now I know, like I've seen it and I go, oh, okay. I think this is a really critical thing to think about is really to understand these different decision makers and influencers. And it's not all Ritz Carlton type stuff and it's all over the board, but I think there could be a new frontier and really trying to understand the experience expectations of different buyers based on who you're working with. And making sure that your marketing team and your sales team understands that. Yeah, fully understands that and fully knows what it feels like. We talk about feeling what it feels like yeah. when you're getting that experience. You talked about Ritz-Carlton. And so we're veering way off here, but I'm loving this because we're having a good time. Yeah, this is great. I'm really curious because you think of Ritz-Carlton and you think of their internal value statement that they gave to their employees. We are ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. Beautiful. They're frontline employees, bellhops, front desk, whoever. They called them ladies and gentlemen. And so to me, that helps the employees kind of elevate themselves into that position. Uh, hey, you know what? I am a gentleman. I'm not just lowly bellboy or whatever. I am a gentleman. And outside of that one example with Ritz Carlton, I don't know if I've ever seen that anywhere else where a company helps their employees elevate themselves to the same sort of status. There's a hypothesis somewhere in there. Yeah, there's a lot to be learned from Hort Schultze, right? He's oh, yeah. amazing. And his uh, book on excellence, I think it's called The Most Excellent Way. It is phenomenal. It's such a great book. And, um, I think there's a lot to be learned from that. And there, you know, just think about places you've gone where you just feel, I travel a lot, just going out to see clients and speaking. And so I went ahead and indulged several years back in the American Express Platinum card. And what I yeah. discovered was when you got that magic little silver metal credit card, they've got this thing in the DFW airport called the Centurion Lounge. Now the DFW okay. airport is the worst place on earth. It's horrible to be in the DFW airport on a layover, which I am quite frequently. However, the Centurion Lounge, when you go up that elevator and the doors open and the scent yeah. of the lounge comes into the elevator and the smiling face behind the desk with the cascading plants on the wall behind says, welcome back, Mr. Amy, it's great to have you here. Like that, you know, is, I will never, ever change credit cards, <laughs> you know, because th that would mean that I would lose this cheering lunch. My podcast co-host, Larry Levine, author of Selling from the Heart, Larry is fantastic. And he used to say, as a salesperson, was obsessively focused on customer experience. And to the point where he would tell his clients or his prospects, once you experience working with me, you're never going to want to stop. <laughs> you're never going to want to stop. Right, And I think just going back to that mindset of the Centurion Lounge, it's a good thing to ask to go, what could you add to your customer experience that's so valuable, over the top, meaningful that nobody would want to change? I mean, a credit card, you can get a credit card anywhere. There's, I get right. five applications every day, right? right? I would never consider looking at any of them because they don't have a, a Centurion Lounge. And you go, what does the Centurion Lounge have to do with processing financial transactions? Nothing yeah, and everything. And that goes back to the experience economy. Pine and Gilmore say even the most mundane businesses can be turned into 
incredible experiences. Oh, yeah. And so that's the question back on all of us is what can we do together to create something that is simply amazing? Yeah. Now, I do want to caveat for anybody else who may be listening into our conversation here. I don't think that that necessarily means that you have to keep upping the ante on luxury. We were talking about C-suite clients and their expectations. Right. That's a luxury experience. So I'll bring it back down to something considered low price, low cost. Yeah. That Southwest Airlines, the experience that they give when I'm flying with them, when I'm interacting with them. Yeah. 80% of the time, they will make me laugh. And it's just like whatever they're doing, like whether it's like like one flight attendant, somebody at the gate, they'll just make jokes and they they're make so me good laugh. at it. Yeah. And you feel good. You have a good feeling. Yeah. Uh, which, by the way, is really smart because a lot of people are anxious when they fly. So helping people, you know, it's a great example of being proactive. I think company culture comes into this, which starts Certainly. to get above my pay grade. But if you think about all of this, and this is where it starts to become fun, right? So you may be in a boring business selling widgets, <laughs> you know, you, but you can look at the customer experience. So you make it fun. I love Jesse Cole. I love the Savannah Bananas. Yes. I love the story of the man in the yellow tux. Oh, and wow. Jesse, I remember walking into a hotel lobby where I was uh, going to a conference and, and, and Jesse is there checking in in line with me. And I'm like, yeah. what the heck? There's a dude in yellow tuxedo. Yep. And, and I got to know every him. Day. Yeah. He's having so much fun. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And he's also sold out his baseball park two years in advance. Yeah. Right. And that's experience. Baseball, yeah. boring. Sorry uh, for any baseball fans out there. I'm one, too. But the game's kind of boring. He made it fun. And as a result, he's crushing it. And it's just the intentionality of going, OK, what can we do to make this experience? You know, he calls it fans first, entertainment, customer first. Right. That's right. And. I was so grateful. I was able to take my boys to our first Savannah Bananas game a couple oh, of weeks wow. ago because they're doing their world tour right now. So we drove to Birmingham, stayed the night in Birmingham, and then drove to Montgomery where they played in Montgomery. And oh, fun. I've read up on Jesse and the Savannah Bananas. I've talked to Jesse before, but you still don't understand until you actually experience it. And there's so many lessons in there, so many lessons. But the biggest one is, like you just said, putting fans first, putting your customer first in all mm -hmm. things that you do. But the cool thing about hanging out with Jesse and, and reading his books and seeing yeah. that, that experience, I've not been yet, although I was watching a movie the other day and like, in the movie, it's a big movie. Like one of the main characters is wearing a Savannah Bananas t-shirt in the movie. I was like, wow, yep. Jesse, this is like over the top. Cool. They made it. But where I was going with this is this is fun for the client. It's also fun for the employees. Yeah. And we live in, we're living in the middle of the great resignation right now. Yeah. Here's a great example. At the bank, while I was standing there waiting for this excruciating long time to process a simple financial transaction. The person behind the desk was grumbling to her other coworker that so and so just quit. <laughs> I was oh. like, if I worked here, I'd quit too. In fact, I think I'm going to quit because the bank, I mean, which there's nothing more boring and mundane than a bank. Maybe I think banking's more boring than baseball. But, you know, it's just, <laughs> I mean, it, it is simple. It, it's just, you know, deposits and withdrawals and loans and all that on one level, another level. It could be an amazing experience. And so because it's such a horrible, poorly thought out customer experience at this particular bank, people are quitting. Right. But nobody's quitting the Savannah Bananas. And, um, no. you know, when you start to really focus on customer experience and you do what Hort Schultze is talking about, where we are gentlemen and ladies serving gentlemen and ladies, right? That's something you want to like, that's something you want to be a part of. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And again, like this is just what came to me just now. So after we talk, I want to go back and do some more research into this. But I think there's something to be said about the identity that you place on your employees and the identity that you help your employees see in themselves. There's so much to be said around that. And it helps them to have more 
pride in their role, helps them to be more engaged, helps them to be more empowered, likely. Well, if you think about leaders and leadership, I mean, leaders cast vision. Most good leaders of organizations have a vision for what they want the company to be like. Well, how does that vision turn into reality? After the motivational speech at the annual meeting, how does that vision turn into reality? It turns into reality by really thinking about the experience, the customer experience and what's it like. And you can also think about the employee experience if you want, different show, but it's that same mindset of going, hey, we've got to think about this from the perspective of people. To quote my friend, Scott McGregor, people over everything. That's it, yeah. You talked about processes earlier. Your people are more important than your processes. It is people first. All right. I know we are uh, running short on time. I want to switch gears just for a moment Ah. because I want to talk about something a little bit different, something a little bit food related, maple syrup. Maple syrup. (laughs) Yeah. Turns out you're a big fan of maple syrup. So I want to know, are there any uncommon foods that you like to pair with maple syrup? Well, so first of all, just to be clear, there's maple syrup and then there's Canadian maple syrup. So being a uh, Canadian kid who married a Southern girl, when someone sends me a quart of pure Canadian maple syrup, you've just become my best friend. Wow. Maple syrup pairs very well with everything. (laughs) I think, yeah, personally, maple syrup is best straight up. (laughs) So Straight up, meaning like you just drink it. That may or may not happen, uh, but I just double dog dare any of your listeners to try it. It's really good. Okay. All right. Well, I'm, I may try that now. Well, and then me being here in Nashville, I'm a big fan of Nashville hot chicken. And so ah. I, I do love chicken and waffles and I love maple syrup on my Nashville hot chicken. There you go. Like I said, maple syrup pairs well with just about anything in my yeah. opinion. Yeah. All right, Daryl, last question for you. If you were to create a five song soundtrack for Revenue Growth Engine and for your work, <laughs> what songs would you include? Well, I put a lot of thought into this, uh, as you know, and I am passionate about helping companies grow. And I think you need an engine yeah. behind all of this. So if you're going to have an engine, you got to get your motor running and head, <laughs> a, head out on the highway. Nice. So that's going to put Steppenwolf and Born to be Wild. I think if you're going to be aligned, you're going to have to come together, tip of the hat to the Beatles. Yeah. Now, this one is uh, not quite so relevant other than the fact it has the word engine in the title and it's by one of my all-time favorite bands, Boston, which is cool, the engines. And really what we want to say here is rev the engines. Yeah. But it's not, you know, we're, we're misinterpreting the song, but it worked. I can't do a playlist without my all-time favorite band, U2. And, and when you get all this right, it's a beautiful day. And in the words of Collective Soul, It all gels. Come on now. Let's gel, everybody. So (laughs) this all works together. Thank you for challenging me to put together a playlist. I'm actually really, really excited to put this on Spotify now. Yeah, well, I'm going to throw it into the Simple Brand playlist now, too. Awesome. Thanks for playing along. Daryl, I've learned a lot from you today, but where can people go to learn more? Yeah, we've got a ton of resources. If you'll text the word revenue to 21,000, that's revenue to 21,000. That'll direct you through to our resources page on revenuegrowthengine.net. And uh, while you're there, there's tons of free resources. And if you'd like a copy of the audiobook, just let us know. We'll get you immediate access for wow. free to all your listeners. But if you want the print book, if you'll uh, chip in for a little shipping and handling, I'll send you an autographed copy. And we want to do everything we can to put resources in the hands of great companies like the listeners to this podcast to help you accelerate your revenue growth. There you go. Well, that's an amazing offer. And to me, like that speaks to what we were talking about at the very beginning. It's all about how we can serve others to help them be better with their business. Absolutely. Excellent. Daryl, great seeing you today. Likewise. Thank you so much for being here. Totally enjoyed it, Matt. Thanks for all you're doing here. I hope you enjoyed my discussion with Daryl Amy. So go and learn more from him and get lots of great revenue growth resources. All you got to do is text the word revenue to 21,000. You can also visit revenuegrowthengine.net slash resources. And when you visit revenuegrowthengine.net slash resources, you can also get a free copy of Daryl's book, Revenue Growth Engine. You only need to pay for shipping and handling. That's a good deal.
And hey, if you're enjoying the Simple Brand Podcast, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. It's going to make it a lot simpler for you to get future episodes like the next one featuring Sarah Frasca. Sarah is a keynote speaker, a global business coach, and an innovation expert. She helps leading organizations cultivate human imagination, build a culture of innovation, and solve complex problems in creative ways, all while helping teams recognize their ability to help all of their employees develop and strengthen their creative muscles. So go ahead and subscribe, and you'll automatically get Sarah's episode as soon as it's live. Until then, keep it simple. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Simple Brand Podcast. Want to make your listening experience simple and automatically receive each new episode? Visit our website, simplebrandpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show in iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. If you're finding value from the Simple Brand Podcast, leave us a rating or review. That helps us get the show to the ears of the people who need it most. Be sure to catch Matt right here next week. Same Matt time, same Matt channel. Until then, keep it simple.